We look with our eyes, but we don't see with them. That is a quote from today's guest. I'm Emily Moyer. You're watching Off Planet Media's Internal Alchemy series, and we have an amazing show to you, for you today, so we're just going to get right to it. Our guest was originally trained as an optometrist and vision scientist, but a life-changing experience in 1976 led him to a deeper understanding of light and the science of life. He is an internationally respected author and speaker, and he has established himself as one of the leading authorities on light and color therapy. I read his most recent book, Luminous Life, How the Science of Light Unlocks the Art of Living, about this time last year on the recommendation of my friend Sonia Barrett. I had intended to reach out for an interview then, but like so many things, it got away from me in all the usual chaos of life. With the current attempts being made to reorder our outer world, there is a need to consider reordering our inner world. For this, one person in particular popped to mind. So I reread his book, and here he is. The magical Dr. Jacob Lieberman is here to help us find a rainbow of light in the clouds of confusion. Welcome to Internal Alchemy, Jacob. Jeez, I love that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yay! <laughs> so, you know, but it's actually... That's great. A rainbow, a rainbow something in the clouds of confusion. Wow, I love it. <laughs> well, you know... Yeah, I, so... I really, I really feel that way. Like, I read your book about this time last year, and it really spoke to me. And then I reread it again this past week, and it was... Uh, gave me some, gr some hope and some comfort, you know? I have kind of a... Uh, even temperament during stuff like this anyway, but like I'm sort of looking for the silver lining here and I thought you'd be a great person to to, to come on and talk about this with. So I'm very happy to you have know, you. You um, know, <clears throat> our mind or what we call our mind, <clears throat> it's actually the mind, it deals in something called duality. It deals in what we call choice and it leads us to believe that we actually can choose but if anyone that's done a diet at some point in their life <laughs> they realize that even though they have the best of intentions and they're disciplined and they do the best they can 99.99999 percent of the people that do these things find themselves where they began or even further down that same track once they've done this. So why am I using this example, which has nothing to do with whether we're eating properly or dieting, whatever, but the ideas of the mind are just ideas. They're concepts, they're theories, which means they're actually the opposite of truth. So truth is one's direct experience. So maybe we can use that as an entryway to, to come into this conversation. Uh, there's an ancient Chinese um, statement that basically says <clears throat> crisis leads to opportunity. As a matter of fact, for them, the word crisis means opportunity. So a Western perspective is we look at crisis as one end of duality and opportunity as the other. Mm -hmm. But in actuality, crisis is a non-dual term. It means a beginning. Why do I say that? Whether you're studying physics, biology, chemistry, it doesn't make any difference. <clears throat> the catalyzing trigger that causes something to expand, whether you call that human transformation revolution or the expansion of electrons <clears throat> into a different state, what's required to trigger that is called perturbance perturbation, aggravation, um, a disturbance of the status quo. So we usually say, oh my God, the shit has hit the fan. But it is when the shit hits the fan that, that you know that something is on track to change, to open. And that is exactly what's going on right now. 
So we'll talk about it in terms of uh, an entire picture. Uh, much of the world is terrified. <clears throat> Why are they terrified? Because we are experiencing something that none of us living have ever experienced. And you say, well, what's the big deal? Well, that trepidation that accompanies something novel, something different than we've ever experienced, is true regardless of species. So whether you're a horse, a dinosaur, an ant, or a human being, when you encounter something you've never encountered, it literally stops you in your tracks. And all of those species go through their own version of what we call worry. They don't know exactly what to do. So the state of the world right now <clears throat> is a, an acute stage of worry. Why is it happening in this way? Because normally when something happens, like for instance, when the tsunami hit Japan a few years ago and took down the nuclear sites, we heard about it, but we were over here. They were the only ones experiencing it. Or in World War II, when some horrific things were happening in Europe, the people there were experiencing it. We were just hearing about it in the news. And if you were far enough away, you may not have heard about it for a long, long time. Why is this situation unique? It is because everyone is having the direct experience at the same time, which means there's a real global shift that's happening right now. It's not that one is awakening and the other one is asleep. Everyone is being put into a situation of seeing in a new way, of relating to life in a new way. So fear, uh, empathy. Uh, this morning I described it to my daughter as feeling a little heartbroken when I, I hear people that have been impacted so devastatingly, losing loved ones in their family or children, God forbid, or being unable to breathe. And so one aspect of our humanity and our bondedness together is that we feel very, very deeply the pain that our brothers and sisters are experiencing. At the same time, I live in Maui, Hawaii, and when I get up in the morning, I notice the birds have never sang so brightly, so clearly, so loudly. Um, it's, it's so exaggerated that there's no way of avoiding it. There's a level of peace that we seek <clears throat> through meditation, to different practices, to try to come to this place. And now this place is being given to us free of charge. There's a level of quiescence in the world that perhaps few people anywhere have ever experienced. We have been spending the last several years talking about a major existential uh, event of our lifetime, climate change, global warming, whatever you wish to call it. My sense is that we have impacted climate change more significantly during this last few weeks than we have with everything else we've ever done. And what's really fascinating is we have not done anything to bring this about. So it's not about doing, it's about stopping. And so what we're experiencing at this time of life is a receding of what we call normal, uh, 
and an emergence of what we call natural. We're not on a schedule for the most part. We don't have to put our alarm clocks on in the morning. There's no planes flying or very few or ships or factories and the sky is clearing and so is our awareness simultaneously our own internal sky so this is a time when we have a unique opportunity <clears throat> not to live in heaven or hell but to hold both simultaneously in the palm of our hands. The loss, the fear or trepidation, the sadness uh, over the impact to so many people, the, the way people are being impacted psychoemotionally, emotionally by losses of income and losses of businesses and things that have been built up that now at least in their mind is dissolving and then at the same time we're having a, a profound opportunity of awakening we are awakening to the peace that we've all always hoped for <clears throat> but never thought would come in this way how can we walk through our lives right now, not on one side of the lane near the sidewalk or the other side near the midline and the other traffic, but how can we keep the vehicle of our life in the middle of the street so that we can simultaneously feel the concern that all of us are impacted by and the incredible uh, liberation that is also happening simultaneously and if we can allow ourselves <clears throat> to simultaneously feel all of this we will have awakened to a new level of delightment that we can take into our everyday life once this situation recedes that's that's at a deep level what i believe is is happening right now is we're getting an opportunity <clears throat> to not live in one end of the duality or another but to remain in the middle continually aware of all that is the fact that for one person their direct experience is exceedingly painful and for another, their direct experience is that they're breathing easily. It allows you to, to feel yourself in every person. Not to be on the outside looking in, but to be on the inside feeling all that is. And, you know, so often we think that when there's an awakening in our lives, that all of a sudden we get whatever we want. We create our own reality. We don't have any more uh, relational issues. Money is not a problem anymore. We always get the parking space right in front of the health food store. <laughs> <clears throat> but in actuality, awakening has nothing to do with that. Awakening has nothing to do with getting what you want. It's the realization that life always provides what is needed, not what is wanted. And the, real, the realization of awakening is more about unconditional acceptance than it is about only wanting what we want. So that's where I feel life has placed us at this moment. Um, and the opportunity is as immense as the crisis. Uh, and there's something beautiful that can begin to 
allow us to see truth, which is something beyond opinion. You know, you listen and one person says, oh, this situation was caused because an organism within a bat jumped into another creature, which then jumped into humans. Then the conspiracy theorists will say, oh, well, it, this was uh, created in a laboratory in Wuhan, China. And all of these things are very interesting for the mind, but neither one of them makes any difference. The only thing that makes a difference is the fact, not the theory. And what is the fact? The fact is that a lot of people are frightened. The fact is that a lot of people are getting ill and that many of them, regardless of age, are breathing their last breath. That is truth. All of these others, who cares? What, what does it make a difference right now? This is a time not to do. That's why everything has stopped. This is a time to embrace our humanity, our beingness. So that's an entree to today's conversation. Wow, that was wonderful. <clears throat> and it, it, uh, that was exactly the kind of thing I, oops. That was exactly the kind of thing I hoped for and expected. And there's a lot of places we can go with that. Um, yeah. In the spirit of what you said, um, it is kind of interesting, right? Like, so you watch the TV or you look at the news on the internet, whichever uh, reality you know, feed you're you know, tapping into. And it's, you know, either like a lot of panic and fear or a lot of, you know, mistrust and talk about, consp you know, conspiracy or this or whatever. But my experience so far has actually been what you're saying. I hear those same birds chirping. It seems very still and quiet outside, right? Like the trees don't know that there's a virus that, you know, right. or they, maybe they know in a more holistic kind of sense, but like the animals are doing their thing and whatnot. And when I go out, um, as, lo as long as you can avoid whatever the, the toilet paper issue is, if you go out and generally people are being nice, people are being helpful and friendly. There's more people in the park exercising than usual because they're not at work. They're with their children. I saw a little kid blowing bubbles in the park the other day and you could see the sort of iridescent prism like reflection that comes off of that. And that to me was like a reminder of sort of the, the beautiful lining of this situation. Um, and you hear, for the first time in years, children during the day outside playing in the street or in their yards, right? right? Usually they're at school or when they get home from school, they're doing homework or on the computer <clears throat> or it's cold, whatever. You're seeing families together. Um, and people, some of us, now that we're home, we're having time to spend time with our family that we haven't had for a long time. We're reaching out to friends we haven't talked to. Some of us are taking this opportunity to work on creative projects that had fallen by the wayside as we go about the daily, you know, necessities for survival or what we think of as necessities. Maybe we're learning some of them aren't such necessities after all. Um, so it is very evident that, right, what you're talking about is not just available to you over in the beautiful land of Hawaii. Right. I'm noticing that here in the urban chaos of Los Angeles, that there is a quiet, there's a peace. Traffic right now is a thing of beauty. You know, when I go out to pick up our takeout food, it takes me 10 minutes to get to a place that usually takes 45. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there's all of these um, little delights that we have forgotten about that we're getting to be reacquainted with, or for some people acquainted with for the first time. And I think, um, I agree with you, like for all of the noise and the hoopla, the fear stuff, I don't actually really feel that in my own direct experience of what's sort of going on on the more expansive level. Um, there obviously are some people who are frightened and who are experiencing health issues and hardships right now. And whether those health issues um, are because of the coronavirus or whether they were health issues that were there already, but we hadn't paid attention to the fact that these people need compassion and help. <laughs> Our attention is being drawn to that as well. So um, absolutely, I think that's you know, uh, undeniable. There, There is something else. When you say, where did this virus begin? 
-hmm. what brought this about. And the organism <clears throat> that gave birth to this virus is the organism perhaps that you can call Gaia, mm -hmm. that you can call the Earth. It's a living organism. And out of that living organism, <clears throat> this thing we call coronavirus emerged. But what caused that to occur? You see, prior to this virus, which is expanding in leaps and bounds, there was a human virus. The virus of doing, the virus of greed, the virus of I can't get enough, the virus of I want what I want when I want it. That virus has been in infecting the natural aspect of life into something that has temporarily <clears throat> caused a significant imbalance on the planet. The air in most places is not breathable. The water in most places is not really optimal for drinking. Humans spend their entire days looking at these tiny little things in their hands that we call cell phones. Mm -hmm. They make little eye contact. And in fact, when they do, <clears throat> we often perceive that something is wrong. We perceive it as a danger. Human contact has been very negatively impacted by technology. These are not opinions. This is what's happening in the world. <clears throat> People's eyesight has deteriorated. We have as many cell phone subscriptions as we have people on the planet. So nobody's short a cell phone. And yet we don't have time to speak to each other, to care for each other, to embrace each other. So my sense is that part of what we're experiencing now <clears throat> is that the place that we reside in, the solar system, a system of and derived from light, <clears throat> which is another word for godliness, has been turned upside down. And so now it's responding in some way that is causing it to expand and this other virus to recede. So we talk about the flattening of the curve of the coronavirus, mm -hmm. but we miss the fact what, that where the curve has really been flattened is in the human virus. Yeah. There's been a flattening of that virus <clears throat> to the point that while most of us are still shocked, many of us are saying, wow, this is scary. And it's also a blessing in disguise. There's something here that is allowing us ah, to breathe a, a sigh of relief. You know, we speak about being at home, being in the safety of comfort of our own home, our own beds. Well, now we're getting that comfort all day long. <laughs> and so... It's a, a very interesting time right now, um, a time where I'm, I'm noticing how often um, clarity is filtering through our awareness. This, moment, this morning I was sitting on my deck having a cup of coffee and I looked up at the sky and it was one of the most beautiful skies I've ever seen. 
<clears throat> the clouds were like a spectacular painting that was continually changing. And I realized, oh my God, many, many years ago, people would utilize different forms of psychedelic to experience these states. Mm -hmm. And now I realize it is my natural state. Mm. Wow, what a lovely place to be. I don't need to change anything. I don't need to have a remote control to try to change the channel of my life. My life is quite beautiful right now. Yeah, I agree with you. Even here in Los Angeles, where the skies, are, a lot of times, you know, we have so much overhead traffic and sometimes yeah. they're spraying things. But actually what's been interesting since the, the lockdown or the sort of stay at home thing, the skies have been clearer than usual. You, you know, even on, on yeah. days that were supposed to have been cold and cloudy, there's been points in the day where the <clears throat> sky clears and the sun is so bright and, and the sky is so blue. It's like, is this a painting or is this real? <laughs> you know, it, it's really that beautiful. Right. Yeah. And things feel yeah. like harmonious. It, I, I liked what you said about, you know, we're not waking up to the alarm clock, right? We can, it, this is a great time, like for people to reset their sort of circadian rhythm to whatever their body naturally wants to do, right? That kind of thing. And, and you know, people are also starting to really ask the question, well, do, we're going to make a trip to the store. What do I really need? As opposed to, I want this, I want that. And I think even this exercise, and this is the, the flattening of the curve you're talking about, this ex, even like the having to wait more than 24 hours for your delivery from Amazon, right? Yeah. Is kind of a really healthy healthy exercise um right you know for people to learn that like okay well like it would be nice to have something but i don't but i still have all the things that i need and, and, yeah. and we you know and the thing will arrive at the time that i meant to have it or to use it or or you know whatnot everything is still ultimately happening right there's still we you know like even though there's all this fear of there's going to be shortages and panic about that everything is still rolling. It's just rolling at a different pace. Right. A pace that we might want to reconsider as being a more appropriate pace for us to live our lives at. So I'm, you know, for me, I've been, you know, obviously there's concern for things that are going on with certain people in the world and, and people who aren't well, but I've been enjoying this and I've been taking this time to like connect with my, you know, I have, the online community I have from doing this show, right? Usually it's just I'm making shows and they're listening and sometimes there's some interaction, but taking the time to really, you know, do stuff with the people, get to know them, to read books that I haven't had a chance to read, you know, because that you put them off, you order them and they stack up on your nightstand and whatnot. And I'm starting to feel like, um, this is all an exercise to help us find balance. You know, the earth will clear itself to find its own balance and it's helping us to do the same. Yeah. You know, human beings uh, in ancient times are given names because these names mean something. It has something to do with the nature of the person or the lineage that they're carrying forth. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true for cities. Mm -hmm. You live in Los Angeles. It means the angels. It was probably named the angels because it was a place that had such a magnificent aura that you were sure that angels resided there. Most people that live in Los Angeles can't even imagine angels living there in normal times, but now you're getting a taste Mm -hmm. you <clears throat> you called it appropriate <clears throat> you're getting a taste of its naturalness and um it's a city of angels and this is giving us an opportunity to re-experience that i totally agree i i'm born and raised here and i've you know 
for many, many years, I didn't, li- I didn't like it here. I, I right. felt like the harshness of some of it. You know, I grew up in the business, you know, a little bit and the Hollywood kind of thing. And it's a big place. And as a child, I found it hard to be seen for who I really was here. Right. And there were so many people and, and a lot of them were, uh, you know, obsessed with things that are, you know, very surface or false. And I didn't like that. And I've lived all over the country trying to find a place that I felt was more suitable for myself. But every time I would end up back here and I've been here consistently for more than 10 years now and I enjoy it here much more than I ever did. But there's a beauty here that sometimes gets overshadowed by all the noise. And right right now it's just sitting still and it's glow. We were at the ocean yesterday. You can see all the way to the mountains. Um, and you can actually go places right now here without having to wait in line for three hours on the freeway. <laughs> right. So it is. It's kind of having its, it, it's, it's an opportunity to shine its, its natural glory kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree yeah. with you. There's a, the, I always called it Lost Angeles, right? Like the Lost yeah. Angels are all here. That's right. Yeah. And is, this is a time for us to find ourselves. Right. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. So, all right. So I think that was like an amazing way to sort of talk about this situation. I want to um, have, give the audience a chance to hear about how you came to this kind of perspective, how your experiences with vision and seeing have led you somewhere completely, you know, through the eyes, but to somewhere else to the answer for, for like the best way to live life and whatnot. Can you tell people a little bit about yourself and how you came to uh, be what you are, what you've always been? (laughs) You know, um, I'm not sure how to answer that question because Most of the time, we try to choose an event in our life. But none of us know when our life began. Did it begin when I emerged from my mother's womb? Or was that emergence the present state of development of the millions of years of humanity that had preceded? We don't know where anything originates within us. You know, we think, oh, this is happening because I had this such and such an event when I was a kid or I didn't get along with my father or on and on and on and on. But these patterns have been going on for millions of years. We will never know their source. And so trying to impact things by using the mind is like trying to chase a wild dog in a parking lot. You probably will never catch it. So how did I come to, to this uh, first of all, I'm 72. Looking good. I'll, I'll be 73 in November. And uh So you have a certain amount of life experiences. And um, although most of us live our lives through our senses, interacting with the external world, the richest part of our life is the internal interaction where we are continually receiving guidance from the intelligence of life, and I'm not speaking metaphorically now or, um, or spiritually, or what I'm speaking about is factually. Everything that's moving in this universe is, is being moved by an animating force, and what's moving the beating of your heart is moving the expansion and contraction of my lungs, is moving the ebb and flow of the ocean, the seasons, the movement of the planets, all of that is animated by the same thing, which has its pulse on everything. And so that movement takes into account everything. So when you ask, how did this occur? 
In the introduction, you mentioned that I had an experience in 1976, and I'll just briefly share that. Uh, at the time, I was practicing as a vision specialist, and like most people in the vision care field, I wore eyeglasses. I had been wearing them for years. Um, this occurred in 1976, so I'd been wearing glasses for nine and a half years. I needed them to drive my car, was on my license. I needed them to see the eye chart. Without them, I could barely see the big E at the top of the chart. And my natural way of seeing things was to see if there were ways um, or epiphanies that could open up new ways of seeing and being. And so I was playing around with everything from vision exercises and nutrition in the early 70s to meditation to yoga, different kinds of things to see would any of them impact my, my eyesight. And everything impacted it to some degree. But I couldn't quite get to where I wanted to get. And one day I had this profound experience where I sat down to, in my daily meditation practice, so I removed my glasses, I sat in a chair, I closed my eyes. I just was noticing my breath. And somewhere in the process, Awareness of self disappeared. I don't know exactly what happened. And today you would say, oh, he had an out-of-body experience. My eyes were closed, but everything in the room, including me, was perfectly clear. Not only was the, were the objects and myself perfectly clear, but the empty space or what we think is empty between whatever was observing and whatever was noticing was filled with activity. It was like sparkling, like everything was sparkling. The other interesting thing was that whatever was observing seem to be seeing from everywhere at the same time. Of course, you and I are having a, a Zoom call and you're in LA looking at me on your monitor and I'm in Maui looking at you on my monitor. But this experience was that whatever was seeing, which was not connected to a human being, was aware of you and me and everything else all at exactly the same time. In fact, the experience was so powerful that when I came out of the meditation and opened my eyes, not only was my eyesight perfectly clear, like at a level that I don't ever remember, but I felt different. And someone said to me later, how did you feel? And what came out of me spontaneously was it felt as though I had become the sky. I disappeared and what remained was everything. And everything was just one thing. Now, <clears throat> I then went to my office. I measured how well I could read the eye chart 20 feet away without any glasses, and I was seeing 300% better, one line better than 2020. I decided to examine myself thinking, well, I don't know how this occurred because this is impossible. But if it did occur, maybe my eyes don't show any prescription anymore, even though I couldn't imagine how any of this could occur. 
So I sat myself behind the instrument, we call it a phoropter, where you do the vision exam, asked myself which is better, one and two and all that. And when I finished <clears throat> and stepped out from behind the device and looked at it, the prescription in the device was almost identical to what was in my glasses. Hmm. What I mean by that is that my ability to read a chart increased by 300%, but the prescription in my eyes did not change at all. The only thing that could cause that to occur is if the seeing is not happening within the eye and maybe not even happening within the brain. Mm -hmm. So when you have such an experience, even for one minute, you say, oh my God, that's a miracle. I've now had that experience for 44 years. It has never changed. I have never worn glasses of any type, distance, reading, or otherwise, since that day, which is coming up shortly, in 1976. What did I do to make that happen? Zero. Nothing. Shift, change, has nothing to do with doing. Has everything to do with seeing. What do I mean by seeing? Awareness is curative. We become aware of something and it changes everything. And it can create those neuroplastic changes in our neurons and in our brain and they begin to change instantaneously, like a spontaneous remission. So that led me on a journey. The first part of the journey was an experiment on the workings of what I called my mind between 1976 and 1980. I wanted to know what caused this so that I could share this with others. And the way I looked at it at the time was, oh, there must be a button somewhere in my brain mind complex that if I could just innervate it, boom, I would know how this occurred and then I could share it with others. Well, I couldn't replicate that because it doesn't have anything to do with me. It doesn't have anything to do with me doing anything. Over time, however, it has remained and as, as it remains, the memory of prior times disappears. So I don't even remember that there was a time in my life that I believed I couldn't see without my glasses on because yeah. I've been seeing well ever since. And what I'm sharing, while on one level it's miraculous, when my second book, Take Off Your Glasses and See, came out, I sent the first copies to my mother and father. And my mother and father, at the time, I believe, were in their early 80s. They lived into their 90s. And they had both worn glasses since I was a small child. After reading the book, I had taken a trip to Miami to visit them. And I stayed with them for a week in their little condo. And while I was there, I all of a sudden became aware that none of them were wearing glasses anymore for anything, even reading. And I said, I notice you're not wearing your glasses. And both of them independently told me that after reading the book, they found themselves naturally taking their glasses off yeah. and not putting them back on. So, awareness is curative. Mm -hmm. uh, hearing something that 
your your innards know is true not something you have to defend it's just a clear knowing can be enough to create a profound shift and um so that's led me into a lot of different work of working with light and color and using color to help people desensitize from the habitual triggers in their life that create distress. And um, what's happening now, I think it's been happening my whole life, actually. In fact, I'm sure of it is I'm often visited by glimpses of clarity. I don't know from where they come. Has nothing to do with me. I didn't do anything f to make this occur. It wasn't because I meditated for 40 days or it doesn't have to do with any of these ideas we have. But what I'm quite clear about is all of us are continually guided by glimpses of clarity. They're not thoughts that we have. They are creations that have us or inspirations that have us. They inspire us to look at and move in a certain direction so that we can fulfill our reason for being. And that's become, that's the most exciting part of my existence, is being in the shower or sitting in the hot tub or having a conversation with someone who I never met, and yet within seconds we find ourselves in a deep place where we both live. How the hell did we get here? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm deeply touched whenever I have this experience and it happens every day in one way or another. <clears throat> and it allows me to realize that we spend most of our time interacting with the outside world and thinking that our source is this chattering noise that we hear inside with all kinds of ideas and desires and so on and so forth. And we're attempting to change the world with all those desires. But I've never found anyone that could do that. And I certainly couldn't. And God knows I've tried everything. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but the great liberator was the discovery that the only reason that we are aware of what we call thinking, which is really almost entirely worrying, but chattering in the mind, the reason we are aware of that is because our true essence is observing it. So we are not the contents of the mind. The mind, the conscious mind, is an accumulation of millions of years of conditioning. And so the worries that come up and all that, we have no idea where all that originated from. We get to notice that, which is the mind-body's attempt to keep us safe. But the real source are, is the field of eyes that sees with no point of view that notices this activity internally, along with all the activity externally, along with all the physical sensations we feel from the body. It's that which is aware of all that is. 
what's the difference between the chatter and this field of awareness? One speaks and has a recognizable voice. The other one sees but never utters a word. So if you're hearing a voice, it's not it. Uh, yeah. What the it is that which is noticing the voice. When you begin to realize that we are not the activity of the mind and that trying to change your mind <laughs> will never bring you anywhere. Once you realize that you are just the observer, the identification with what Ramana Maharshi termed the self, which he also said was equivalent to God, is what is accessed. You are directly accessing your source, which is a holographic focal point of light known as godliness. That is what sees all, knows all, everywhere at the same time. The Bible describes the creative force, what they call God as that. Spiritualists refer to consciousness, which is the creative force, as light, so does the Bible. And physicists say the ground of reality, the energy from which life arises, is also light. When we access the noticer within, we are seated on the throne of light. May just be momentarily, but these moments over a while begin to realize that we are that. The thing we are looking for through meditation and all of these different things, we already are there. That is what we are. In fact, the whole purpose of meditation is to notice the activity of the mind because as you notice it, you begin to realize that you're not the mind, just like you're not your television set that you're watching. You're the noticer. And that is what truly frees everything up. Hmm. Wow. No choice is necessary. No thinking required. Everything occurs all by itself. And you say, well, that's ridiculous. We all have to do things. Well, do we? Look out in Mother Nature and tell me one thing that we are in control of. Okay. All right, I'll give you that one, Jacob. But of course, we control our own lives. Oh, good. What do we control internally? Do we control our heart, our breathing, our blood pressure, our blood sugar, our hormonal release? Do you realize there is nothing within our physiology that is designed to initiate action? <laughs> Everything is responding to guidance from the animating force of life, and it receives that guidance via signals of light, and light, by the way, is invisible. You can't see light. So all of our cells maybe a hundred trillion of them in the body, just like the eyes in our head, all of these cells have eyes. And these eyes are designed to detect and respond to the invisible energy of photons. Mm -hmm. Not the brightness we experience that we think is light, but the actual essence of light, which is formless which you can never see, it's totally invisible. And that light, interestingly enough, 
behaves in such a way that whatever action it takes, it always takes in the least amount and most efficient period of time, which means <laughs> that our systems are designed to always be at our maximum potential. There is nothing we can do to be more, and there's nothing we can do to be less. Our system is always responding with its totality. It may change in the next moment, but in this moment, this is as good as it gets. So we have so many concepts we live by, but have nothing to do with actuality. And so a major aspect of our liberation is the direct experience of truth. And as I mentioned earlier, truth is different than opinion. So in today's culture, mm -hmm. a very common word is belief. Yeah. Oh, that's your belief. Oh, you need to change your belief. Well, belief is virtual. Belief, idea, thought, concept, theory, they all mean the same thing. But truth is the word that means the opposite of belief. Mm -hmm. So our beliefs are not truth. So all the things we talk about, oh, I think it's going to, they have nothing to do with life. Life is a direct experience. And when you have a direct experience, what I mean by that is the clarity that happens when we're not looking. Yeah. Just like I sat outside this morning, I looked up at the sky, and all of a sudden, I was gone. And all there was was something that I cannot describe, but that totally silenced me. It just brought everything to a halt, and it was, as Jesus spoke of, the truth that sets you free. Wow. <laughs> so that's a little bit of... That, that was perfect. Uh, that was amazing. Yeah. I, there's, you know, I, there's a, a, there was so much there, and there's a lot of things I could say, but I don't think I need to say any of them because I think you said them all perfectly. But what I will say is that you just answered a question, an experience, like explain an experience I had that I have been unable to explain to myself, make mm -hmm. sense of for it's been had about 10 or 12 years now. Um, and maybe on the other side, I will uh, tell you what that is and tell that to everyone. I think uh, this is a good place to sort of wrap up the uh, public segment of this. And then we're going to move over into the patrons hour where we're going to I'm going to take the opportunity to ask some questions I have about eyes and vision and light and whatnot to uh, somebody with your, your expertise and wisdom that I don't usually get. But can you tell everybody where they can find your work and how they can experience some more of the divine wisdom you just shared with us? <laughs> um, they can go to my website, which is jacoblieberman.org, and Lieberman is spelled L I. B as in boy, E-R-M-A-N. This is not a marketing website. We're not trying to sell you on all kinds of things and so on. That's not what it's about. It's really just a sharing, just a sharing of things that, so there's a lot of little short two and three minute sound bites from live presentations that people may find very nice, inspiring. They can go to my Facebook page and uh, we upload things all the time. Uh, just things that I feel will touch people. Um, and um, uh, my, so that's how they can access me. Um, 
if they need books and things like that, they they have to go to Amazon and so on. I'm not a bookseller. Or the bookstore, yes. <laughs> or the bookstore, yeah. Um, and my work in the world um, takes three forms primarily. One is public sharing, like an interview or a talk. Uh, and... Um, all the talks that I do are totally live. They are not rehearsed. They are not planned. There's no notes. Um, it's as live as this conversation. It's truly live. And so I never know exactly what's coming through. Um, and there's something exciting about that because it, it's not a copy. It's an original. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I feel very blessed for myself when I have that experience. <clears throat> so that's one aspect of my work. Another is I, I do consulting work where I, I work with a company, for instance, right now that manufactures light-based medical technology, and I'm developing some new equipment for them to help people. And then uh, another major aspect of my work is that I mentor a small number of clients. I, you know, never would work with more than three or four at a time. It's not done as a group. It's individual work. Um, and um, what do I do in my mentoring work? Nothing. Um, I, I merely, we just develop a special relationship. Uh, you see, I always say love is the answer regardless the question. When I used to be a doctor, I used to train doctors, I would say to them, don't work with anyone you don't love. If you don't care for a person, refer them somewhere else. They're not just a number or a patient. The most potent aspect of the healing equation is the relationship. So... A very big part of my mentoring work, aside from the, a very unique way that I use color to help people and I give them a kit that I've created for this and so on. Um, but aside from that, a lot is just responding to the experiences of their life. So their life is the curriculum. I don't have a curriculum for them. Their life is the curriculum that's bringing them home. I just accompany them on the journey. And much of what we do is dissolve ideas. And in dissolving them, allow the emergence of truth. Not my truth, but whatever is guiding them. So, and the most important part of our work is the day that the client leaves the nest mm -hmm. and doesn't require any more of this. They have their own navigational system. They trust their own guidance. And so, you know, all of us need a helping hand at some time in our lives. We've all gone through losses. Many people are going through that now. You know, we've all lost a loved one or maybe lost large amounts of money or lost our job or something. And our heart is broken for a while and we feel broken. And during those times, it would be nice to have a friend that doesn't tell us what we need to do, but actually listens to us and only reflects when it's invited. And something profound about that, because we each have a homing device within us that brings us back home. Mm -hmm. And when that's not impeded or disturbed, <clears throat> but allowed to do what it naturally knows, we get taken to where we start. So, that's something else that I offer as well. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Well, excellent. That sounds amazing. I, actually, I was looking at your website yesterday and noticing that. And at some point, I may avail myself of your mentoring services. Sure. All right, guys, we're going to move over to the patrons hour. To join us over there, uh, sign up at patreon.com forward slash off planet media, and we will see you on the other side. We will be right back.